and uh, welcome to this uh, last session of our conference, uh, the 10th session, and uh, we will have uh, some, uh, and, and some changes. Uh, the first uh, speaker uh, of today, of this session, is uh, Maria Joao Sousa, uh, and um, she is a uh, music teaching, she is a violinist, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, singer also. And uh, the paper she is uh, giving is um, music iconography in a private collection of tile panels, panels uh, under the theme consumption. Please. Hello, good afternoon to everyone. It has been a privilege to attend such a variety of presentations in this symposium. I hope this contribution of mine interests you as well. I'd like to thank you, the organization, for the opportunity to be here today. Music iconography in a private collection of tile panels, panels under the theme consumption situations is the title of my presentation. I will describe you and show you a tile panel for the restaurant Portugalia in Setubal. However, it is very important for me to be here with you to present not only the panel, but the artist who painted them. José Feria was born in Paio Pires, near Seixal. But during his childhood, he lived across the country due to the work of his father, who was a bricklayer. Having lost her mother since the age of 12, she was a great influence to him. He remembers her doing pencil drawings. He inherited her sensitivity and the gift of drawing. When little Zé was six years old, she took him to the Grand Vasco Museum in Viseu and in front of one of the most emblematic paintings by Vasco Fernandes, São Pedro sitting in the chair, she told him, José, now look into his eyes, walk around and then tell me what's going on. And the child answered, ah, he's always looking at me. Later, the painter learned the techniques that allowed to master this optical illusion effect, but his episode marked him forever. Already orphaned by his mother, his father authorized him to attend the Antonio Arroyo Industrial School Applied Arts, the only school in Lisbon at that time for boys and girls. Nowadays, it's the Antonio Arroyo Secondary Art School. His father did not enroll him in painting or drawing, as was the teenager wish, but in engraver and lithographer curse, as in the secretariat guaranteed him that this course would have more professional opportunities. The technical professional course lasted five years, but by this time, young José was already working during the day and studying at night. A year before joining the mandatory military service at the age 18, he met Cipriano Dourado, who took him to the Cooperative of Engravers. He became a member and completed after the arming the engraving, calcography and serigraphy course. We are seeing Corredores do Palacio, an engraver by José Faria. During the five years of military service here in Portugal and in Angola, he painted only one portrait and two oil paintings. It was a very difficult period. When he returned, he got a job as a visualizer. Here, he found a compromise between earning money and doing something he enjoyed. Married to Dulce Faria and having three children, he had to support a family. After working from nine to six, he was in the cooperative until 4 a.m. It was very difficult to be an artist in Portugal. In 1977, at the invitation of his father-in-law, he moved with the family to Malaga. Here he worked as a graphic designer in his father-in-law's company, as well in others, and taught in various locations. He made logos, labels, posters, flyers, and so on. He was in charge as an artist of some political and cultural event in Malaga, such as drawing for the electoral campaigns for the first democratic election, elections, and publicized the first public tribute to Pablo Picasso, organized by the Communist Party of Spain. Paloma Picasso, 
daughter of the painter, was present at this tribute and congratulated Giuseppe for his drawings. On his return to Portugal, he moved to the village of Schenke in Mafra and set up his studio there. That year he teach at the Antonio Arroyo, Arroyo School. For 14 years, he teached drawing and engraving at the Jacó Rodrigues Pereira Institute of Casa Pia in Lisboa, where he taught for deaf young people. At Casa Pia, he studied Portuguese sign language, but preferred to exemplify with drawing. José Faria is an engraver and masters all calcographic and lithographic techniques. Here we are seeing Sant Antonio co with the boy. José Faria, ah, over the last 30 years, he works, um, his works were exhibited all over the world and has works permanently in museums and contemporary art centers. His graphic work has been edited by several official and private institutions in Portugal and Spain. In 2012, together with his wife, Dulce Faria, he founded the Atelier Ponto de Luz in Lisboa, in Largo de Santo Antonio de Sé, near the cathedral, Sé Cathedral. And there it, ha uh, it has a permanent exhibition of his works and where José Faria teach engraving, drawing, and painting. But Ponto de Luz is more than atelier. It's a cultural space with musical events and where artists can have their temporary exhibitions and you are all invited, of course, to visit uh, Atelier Pontelouch. After this brief biography, let's talk about the work that brought me here. Portugalia is a very famous beer house in Portugal. Uh, it's a restaurant who, are, who is famous for, for beer, seafood, and the famous steaks. Um, he was born on the 10th of June in 1925 in Avenida Almirante Reis, uh, and um, it was uh, a meeting point of students, artists, and journalists. It has a bohemian atmosphere. In 1997, he started the expression abroad the country. In 1999, Manuel Vinha, the chairman of the administ administration of Portugal's restaurant chain, proposed seven tile panels to the painter José Faria to enrich seven new establishments under the theme situations of consumption with a pleasant environment to stimulate the appetite. For the painter, painting situations of today people consuming in a resta restaurant wouldn't be something so inspiring or aesthetic to him. Therefore, he proposed that the situation of conception should take place in a late period without defined centuries to mix times and customs with freedom. The project had first been handed over to an Argentinian <coughs> artist who painted the panel of Portugal of Cais do Sudre in Lisboa. Nowadays the, nowadays, the management of Portugal is carried out not by Manuel Vinha's family, but the Carvalho Martins family. José Faria painted seven murals for the Portugal restaurant that were inaugurated uh, in the following order, in Cascais, Lisboa, Espelho d'Água, in Belém, Setúbal, Madeira, Fórum de Almada, Coimbra, and Serra da Estrela. In la temática figurativa predomina la representación de la mujer portuguesa, siente preferencia por la mujer madura o anciana, gorda y bonachona, campesina, musculosa y trabajada, Faria is a gravador poet, a lyric that realizes a graphic so femininely loose and with a technical technique so sensitive as only the soul of Portuguese was able to make the things. José Faria is best known by his works on the Portuguese woman. Although music is not part of the painter's central inspiration, the musical presence in those convivial acts of, of uh, conception was notorious, therefore musical elements appeared appear represented in these works, accessible to the consumers of the restaurant. That's why I chose them to show you here. The artist was inspired by the 18th century aesthetic. Although these panels also feature musical mo motifs, I will talk more um, detalladamente, in detail, uh, about Setuba, Setuba, but I would like to show you this. The, Qui <coughs> the Coimbra has the, the academic, uh, traje académico. So this is a student of Coimbra with the Portuguese uh, guitar. This is a Lisbon uh, Espelho Diago with a, a guitar. 
Here we have in Foro on the Almada a trio with flute, um, a violin and a guitar. And here we have Madeira, the brinquinho. Uh, it is a percussive instrument with castanets and uh, bottle uh, caps. Um, but um, I would like to present the Setúbal, where the mezzo-soprano Luisa Todi is represented, and the poet Manuel Maria de Barbosa de Bocas, both born in Setúbal in the 18th century, and they talk pleasantly to the sound of seagulls, beer mugs, and Portuguese guitar sounds. When the construction works of the restaurant began, the painter visited the place and surrounding landscape to be motivated, and this is when the Bahia de Setúbal sings the Tejo. Um, yeah. Then he began to study customs, going to cultural centers, and looking for visual elements of the past. In a meeting with the restaurant architect, he acknowledged the measure Sado, no, I know Tejo Sado. Sorry. Uh, in a meeting with the restaurant architect, he acknowledged the measurement and the vertical space in square meters. For inspiration, he saw portraits and engravings from the Baroque era. He consulted journal Setúbal of the early 900s, where he saw many mandolin family. Here, here we have the family de Romeu Correa, women playing and men playing the mandolin. And he saw also Portuguese uh, guitar here in the, the street, a man playing the Portuguese guitar and the a fado ensemble. Yes. In Portugal, it's Setúbal, José Ferri had a limited space. To be able to see it, the panel was made above chairs level. Now I will present the, the motives of the panel, and I start to speak about the Setúbal specific characteristics. So he wanted to show you the two most distinct land characters, a famous, the famous opera singer, Luisa Todi, with a great European career in the 17th, during 1777 and 1799, she has a, she sang in Russia, Germany, Italy, with success. And she's holding a sheet music. And we have Bukash, the poet. Um, yes, with a feather. He's writing with a feather. We have sardines, the, the fish, grilled sardines. I don't know you know, it's a, a very tasty fish. We have, uh, 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 here we have fishermen, also very specific from Setúbal. Um, mm -hmm, seagulls there, and the fado guitar players. Elements that show the conception situations, we have beer, lobster, employees and customers, happy indeed. And um, the musical elements, this is the Portuguese guitar, the historically famous opera singer and the sheet music and the music has not nothing on purpose. I, I asked him and it's not nothing special. The painter is here, he painted himself with Manuel Vinhas, the chairman, and they are doing a, a toast, they are celebrating also. José Faria wanted dignity in the figures and in their gestures. Unfortunately, this restaurant closed two years ago so I was unable to visit the panel in situ. These photos were kindly provided by the Director of Strategic Marketing, Communication and Corporate at Portugalia. The panel was removed, disassembled, cleaned and stored in a warehouse on the private collection of Portugalia in Lisboa, Avenida Almirante Reis. This process was always ensured by the professional who takes care of laying all panels. Quimbra panel is also disassembled and stored in the same warehouse. In addition to the large panel, all restaurants have this characteristic, an invitation figure, figura de convite, at the entrance. This historic figure was a painter's request. He wants a man standing at the entrance, formally dressed, inviting customers to the restaurant. With those city elements, he made a small scale drawing and showed it to Manuel Vinhas, and once the design was approved by him, he drew it in a full scale, like he, here, on a tracing paper, papel vegetal, placed on a wall, and then transferred the drawing to the raw tiles. These tiles were baked or fired in the Bisses ceramic kilns. Ceramic Bisses started production in 1988, 
and up to date continues to manufacture their own tiles according to tradition in pure clay, wet, sharp edge with 14, 14 centimeters and eight <coughs> thickness, thereby maintaining a high quality standard and the character of traditional tile. To become familiar with the color process, Jose Faria trained for a year with a tile specialist. He experimented, experimented and painted on tiles, realized which colors he wanted to use. High fire powder paints, a mixture of glass, colored powder and water, have a coat because the colors after cooking change their tone. For example, blue is a dark gray pigment when painting. The pigment mix with the tile very quickly and the ink on porous glass has a very high absorption capacity. There is no room for mistakes. You can apply only one brush stroke slowly in a single gesture because an error meant a new tile. After being painted and before being baked, the tiles were organized by letters and numbers and were placed on a large wooden trays for baking. While the tile was waiting to be baked, sometimes it took a week, it couldn't be moved or blown as it would damage the paintwork. The tiles were fired between 800 and 1000 degrees and took two days to cook and another one day to cool down. Between seeing the, the works of the restaurants and finish finishing the panel, two months would pass, which would be the time for the restaurant to be ready as well. I end my presentation with a video showing José Faria painting one of the panels in Portugalia, the one in Covilhã and uh, Terra da Estrela with the shepherds from the mountains. We will appreciate both the ballet of the single brush stroke and after this and the hat uh, brush stroke, we will see the dry pond punta seca, the dry pond technique used in engraving, where the line after line reproduces the darkening or highlightening effect. And because this symposium is about music and because music was made to be heard and experienced in this present moment, the video will be accompanied with music. <laughs> We will listen words from Bukage, sung by an opera singer, as Luisa Todi herself, accompanied by the Portuguese guitar rhythm effects and the sound of the sea, not the Sado, but the Tejo river sounds. <coughs> Incorporating the musical element of the tile panel in one musical piece by Pedro Sousa, dedicated to José Faria. He's doing the dry pond technique here. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Maria Joao de Souza, for this uh, multi multimedia uh, 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 presentation. Yes, uh, and also I think uh, in these uh, days, uh, during these days, we 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 saw a lot of these uh, 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 walls uh, with uh, with uh, tails and uh, drawings, and uh, you you showed us finally how how. Um, the, the technique, uh, and this is very interesting, uh, and uh, thank it you. It was also interesting to me because I didn't know so much yes, about uh, tiles, and it was uh, in conversation with uh, Gilbert Tellier that also I learned a lot. No, no, it, it is very interesting, and so we also, we, 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 we can know, we can understand how it is, because uh, you know, we, of course it, it, should, it is something very complicated, but uh, we, we have an idea at least now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if there uh, are uh, any questions uh, about uh, this uh, paper. Yes, Cristina, Cristina Santarelli. It's only a remark. Uh, there was something uh, Sephardic in this uh, melodia that you sang. Mm -hmm. It was uh, made by him, the composer is Pedro. So, and he can talk about talk about a little bit with the melodic uh, inspiration that you also talked to me. Maybe you can explain if you want to, with the micro. Hello, I'm a composer by formation. Um, the, the, the technique of the melody was created uh, with a mode that I created with the, the okay. With my face, all my face. Um, uh, I created the melody with the, 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 the words of the, the, the soneto, the sonnet, his ultimus cantus, the last songs. Uh, and I, I take the letters and I transform to the music, like Bach, B, A, C, H, I did, the, the, and I create a mode and I, I create some gestures of the waves, repeat gestures also when repeat some words to identify the, the public who, who can listen and identify the same uh, ideas. So musically is, is uh, that um, melody is the, the, that reason. The guitar are playing uh, not an unusual um, way because the, the the way traditional to play, tan tan tan, pam 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 pam, like last yesterday we saw, we heard, no, like a lira, like a tajit, like a, a Greek song. So I transform, I I I look the the, the guitar, the Portuguese guitar to a, a Greek instrument, not a Portuguese instrument, not a, another kind, because the poem uh, spoke in tajidus. They are the, the deuses, gods of the Tejo. So I, my inspiration was that I don't, uh, I, I hope that you like it. <laughs> thank you, thank you so thank much you. for this. Uh, this uh, yes, also for your explication. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now I think there uh, will be the paper by Lucia Rocha and Margarita Freire Moleiro. And uh, uh, according to the information of the Muse Museo Municipal Carlos Reis Inventory, the pianoforte Matthias Bostam was donated by the painter Carlos Reis in 1937. Carlos Reis was born in, in Torres Novas. That, that's why he, uh, he is such an important figure for, for, for this uh, city. Um, this same year, 1937, is the year of the opening of the local museum to the public under the curatorship of Gustav Pinto Lopes, P Gustav Pinto Lopes a local politician, but an important figure in Mozambique colonial history. There, there is a huge gap in the museum's history from the years following the donation up to 19, 1994. Why 1994? 
because it, it dates back to the, to, the, uh, to the first interest from the, the technics and the workers of the museum um, to the presence of these instruments in their collections. The piano fort built by Matthias Boston in 1977 in Lisbon, Portugal, is um, a rare musical instrument of national and international relevance. The piano's mechanism is very similar to the instruments built by the Italian Bartolomeo Cristofori, being one of the latest instruments with such features. It is important to mention that in, I think in the late 19th, but if it was not in the, in the, the, the decade, uh, the last decade of the 20th century, Professor Dodor, if he, he will tell me, that uh, he visited the museum uh, in order to see the instrument and to take some notes for his book, um, Portuguese string, uh, string Keyboard Instruments of the 18th Century, Clavichords, Harpsichords, Forte Pianos and Spinets, published in 2005 by the Gulbenkian Foundation. So this visit from Professor Dodorer, it is very important because it is the first approach from academia, from the academic world to the, to the instrument. It was uh, noticed by the, um, by the curators in the museum that the instrument present, presented several problems, as you can see in here. Some cracks. So the uh, Torres Novas City Hall decided to uh, start a restoration process, being in our opinion, uh, this is the actual curator, uh, Dr. Margarida da Moleiro, um, not so um, careful in the, in the, in the um, reflection about the restoration process because they, they look very close, of course, in a very prestigious institution, the, Insti the Instituto uh, Polytechnic Tumar, the Polytechnic Institute in Tumar, that is famous, in, uh, is, it's a famous institution in our country for their uh, restorations in wood, but they didn't have, have particular experience in musical instruments, just in furniture. So Professor Fernando started um, an, an, an intervention, and uh, of course, uh, an, mo more an aesthetic intervention, as we can see here, But after uh, he is finished, uh, we uh, made some visits already with the support of the CESEMS and NOV FCSH, and we understood that uh, there were quite a number of options that were consider considered not the best ones for the instrument, that may or may not have damaged the instrument, but uh, we still don't know about the effects. So the instrument is really beautiful. It was a, an aesthetic um, renovation, but we don't know how that affects the, the woods and the sound produc production. So, at least layers of its history were dramatically removed because the instrument is shining. So, but uh, the, the layers of history were removed in order to put it quite beautiful. But um, quite unusual in this process was the fact that the instrument was held hostage for several years at the hands of its restorer, who, who refused to return the piano to the museum and to the city hall, trying to impose a second phase in the restoration process. So several claims were filled by Margarida and the museum, and um, after an epic process um, of several years, Um, the instrument came back home to, to the museum. And uh, uh, it's not an easy process. We still couldn't get the documents of uh, the photographs, the, the all, all his files that he should return to the city hall. Um, it, uh, we, Margarida asked it for so, so many times. I know she, she <laughs> so many. And he, he don't send the, the papers. He don't want to. Um, this is 
not a very professional attitude and um, this is something we want to alert that can happen to any museum. It's not quite a, a, a common situation. Um, but um, we want to show the instrument after the restoration process also. And also the actual display in the museum. So you can see that the instrument is very beautiful. At this point, I just want to say that we are studying with uh, extremely uh, precaution a second phase of the restoration process. I, the museum is uh, being advised by Professor Dodrer and also by Gerd Karman that you saw yesterday. And we are so strongly considering on uh, putting the instrument uh, playing back again because we, we think that we have uh, a very good material sold for sound production. So anyway, Margarida also made a relevant proposal of um, an application of the instrument to, to the category of national treasure. But even though this restoration process is not over, is not finished, and we consider it as a sort of uh, Hollywood action movie, and we hope that uh, no one in the world has to pass what Margarida is passing through. And the, the purpose of this paper is not so much a musicological or an organological uh, study because that uh, it will be done after the second phase of the restoration process, but to, uh, uh, to, to, to tell you this strange and awkward story and uh, to, uh, so that we can think how can this happen in the 21st century in, in professional and academic institutions that are working together in cooperation, a piano being uh, kidnapped and keeping hostage at, at an institution. So uh, we'll thank you for your, your attention. It's just a very brief presentation, but I think it's a very important appoint, appointment in this symposium. Margarita, just want to, to say something? Um, uh, I would like to say that uh, it is uh, because of our recent uh, partnership with the uh, CESM and with the uh, Lisbon University that we have the opportunity to look at the instrument in a another way, in a, with other methodology, with other eyes, with uh, more knowledge. With, we didn't have this knowledge, and I know that my colleagues, when they, they thought about restoring the, the piano forte, they are thinking that they are doing great thing for the instrument. But in fact, these uh, local museums don't have uh, the the right professionals or the specialized professionals to do this. So it is very important for the museums to have these partnerships with the university and to have this possibility to work together. It is really, really important that uh, science um, um, has uh, an, open, an open door inside of the, for the museums. And we are very grateful for this opportunity to work with the university uh, and we hope that this time we can do it better and, if, and we can do it uh, well. Thank you. Um, I just want also to, to add that we are uh, thinking about a, a future symposium with Professor Dodor, but only after the second phase of the restoration process. So uh, I hope that we may join all there and to celebrate the rebirth of a musical instrument. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, this paper that is uh, also a good example of uh, cooperation, of uh, uh, synergy eh, between institutions and to put together different kind of, kind of knowledge of, uh, uh, yes, it's very important. This is, and it is not done, it is not obvious. Uh, and so I think that it is really a good example and uh, um, yes, to, should be very spread and very, thank you. Uh, maybe there, is, there are uh, any question about uh, this uh, paper? Professor Dedre. Uh, just let me say uh, a small, uh, uh, 
let me give a small commentary about uh, the history of the instrument. Uh, I think uh, 20 years ago there happened uh, uh, a thing which is quite, quite assuring for uh, any kind of teacher. Uh, when a former student came to me and said, uh, Professor, um, I saw the instrument in Torres, uh, Torres Novas and uh, uh, there was a written harpsichord and the year of constructing. But he told me, uh, I am looking what you uh, showed to us in your classes, that can't be a harpsichord. I, I am seeing small hammers uh, in, in the instrument. It should be a pianoforte. And this was the reason for me uh, to, to look in, uh, nearer to the instrument. Uh, and really, we find out that it was uh, um, the most magnificent pianoforte built in, in uh, the 18th century Portugal. Uh, it is clearly um, a kind of uh, luxury model. Uh, surpassing uh, not only by the other Portuguese instrument, but uh, coming very, very much better and uh, obviously uh, much, much uh, different in terms of price and uh, production. We don't know who, for whom the instrument was, was built. That is quite, quite uh, difficult to see. But uh, let me say uh, only that uh, it would be very, very nice we uh, could uh, g give back to the instrument th the former uh, kind of uh, sounding image uh, which uh, it, it had uh, in, in, in former times. Thank you. And um, Sergio Marcelo de los Santos who is uh, a specialist, uh, is from, uh, uh, from um, the University of uh, Republic of Uruguay, and uh, he is uh, a, um, a specialist uh, on uh, theatrical design. And uh, his paper, uh, the title of his paper is on image uses, visual construction of the scenic element, a photograph and memory. Please. In this reading, there is a contrast of theoretical elements and experimental results related to the use of visual images in the creation of a scenic dramaturgy. These theoretical elements belong to two fields, image studies and theatrical creation, the latter of which I relate here through a specific case. Establishing a comparative study is not the, the aim. This work is intended to show how the methodology used for visual production in the performing arts makes evident the use of an iconographic, iconological method as an instrument of the, of the creative process. I have select selected this photograph that was part of the exhibition General Strike of 1973 at the Montevideo Photographic Center with the title Flyers in the main hall of the Teatro Solis, circa 1973 author Aurelio Gonzalez. The photo had been published in 2011 with the same title in a voluminous history in pictures of the author's work. I had found, I had found it before in the Teatro Solis commemorative compilation 150 years of stories from the stage with the caption flyers during a performance, Aurelio Gonzalez donation, 1973. The selected photo is significant for its functionally as a record of a challenging social use towards the dominant discourse at the beginning of the civil military dictatorship of the Plata Liberation, while at the same time, it condenses part of the conflict, the speeches and the visions of that time as an image of resistance and memory. Among the work materials for the elaboration of the dramaturgy and the visual aspects of the opera The Consul produced during the 2017 lyrical season at the of the Teatro Solis, the analyzed photo was included. 
the starting point of for the for each study is at the crossroads of my exercise exercise in theatrical design with a line of research performing research in performing arts mm -hmm. that began several years ago it is an approach to theoretical phenomena according to the per perspectives of production and reception of the symbolic social and historical aspects linking social cultural and political data in a fabric of relations with society as a whole with different social groups and institutions it is at these crossroads where the relationship with between the, the selected photo and the production of the council at the teatro solis began in which i participated as an as art director the proposed objective is to take an image as a source of affiliations between phenomena, representations, and cultural objects from different times. I have analyzed the image from the point of view of its technical medium, morphology, production conditions, and reception possibilities. In this last aspect, it should be noted the journalistic context of 1973, as well as in the present, its institutional use and its, its use within a process of scenic creation. There is a, man, a multiplication of views, but also an intended synthesis based in the, in, on the testimonial value of the chosen photo. I compile information appropriate, appropriate to the Uruguayan context of 1973, which revolves around a coup d'etat and a general strike and consequently contrasted notes of that documentation with interviews and results of my own previous research carried out in, on the subject, the approach, the object, and the, cost, and the case study integrated in the field of theory and history theater, of theater. Confronted with the challenge of facing a wide spectrum of theoretical and methodological proposals, positioning itself beyond our disciplinary boundaries and limitations, the research makes use of uh, the crossing of disciplinary boundaries, taking contributions from an interdisciplinary theoretical set in correspondence with the methodological paradigms of iconography and iconology. In this spectrum, discourses, point of view, contribution, approaches, currents, and fields are presented as a jungle of position and interpretations, according to the expression of Professor Baldassarri during a similar gathering to this one in Salto, Uruguay, in 2019. Hence, in order to carry out my exploration, I made use of a large number of materials found in that diverse interior. I have dealt with the photo as such with, the, with its compositional features, its properties or peculiar characteristic as a symptom that through the interpretation of its symbolic values gives access to more particularized evidence, turning it into a document on the personality of its author, its time and punctually the outlet to, to which they belong. In a second stage of the work, I focus on the approaches to several of the concepts handled by the iconographic and iconological methods, studying the effects of the image through its application in the field of scenic dramaturgy. This is an image produced in a 35 millimeters negative that frames a sector of a theater hall, of which, despite the wide framing, only a partial view is achieved. The audience can be seen in, in the stalls and two levels of boxes with their supports and decoration based on moldings. From a third level, the, the, the audience left out of the field cannot be seen. The, de the, the depth of field allows a large number of shots, but none of them is sufficient, sufficiently sharp. The black and white surface is slightly blurred, particularly in the case of less illuminated areas. Even so, there is a perfect notion of the shapes, the architecture of the room, the audience, and several falling objects recognizable as sheets of paper. The absence of a, of a frame leads to restoring what is outside the field of the image through an associative mechanism tri triggered by the environment, a scenographic in certain way, identifying that sector of the whole as that 
of the Teatro Solis. After that localization, the recognition of what is happening is, is pending. Why this movement of the, of the action from the stage to the hall? The linguistic element is this decisive on this. The orientation comes from the caption, flyers during a performance, flyers in the main hall of the Teatro Solis, 1973. I found cues to put in, uh, together a chain of relations based on the, peri on the period in which this photo was produced and taking it as a source of information, as a document allowing the discovery of a historical cultural relationship with that time. On June 27, 1973, President Juan Maria Bordaberry, supported by the armed forces, decreed the dissolution of parliament. In rejection of the coup, the National Workers' Convention organized a general strike with the occupation of workplaces, which lasted for 15 days despite the strong crackdown and issue. In this context, the photojournalist Aurelio González, head of photography for the communist newspaper El Popular, recorded the main event, events of the strike with the aim of giving testimony of the organized resistance uh, to the coup d'etat. The strike was led by a mobilized society, strongly discipl disciplined and organized to oppose the coup. During the 60s, an interclass alliance had been woven between the, the organized working class with broad sectors of the urban middle classes, mainly among the ed educated and professional sectors, es essentially intellectually, intellectual petty, petty bourgeoisie that left its mark on the Uruguayan left wing and political culture. Aurelio Gonzalez received his daily practice in the newspaper, conceived the, uh, his daily practice in the newspaper as part of the politic, political militancy for which he was widely recognized in the union and political left-wing uh, media. El Popular allowed an opening to other sectors of society in addition to those belonging to the left-wing or the Uruguayan Communist Party. It lacked the moral indoctrination and rigidity of other communist publications. It had political and union pieces, but also sports and other subjects that could be of interest for a more diverse spectrum of audience. It was an, a, a means of expression of cultural openness raised by a renew, renewal on the party leadership. It was possible that the news, newspaper intended to, rec, to record an event in the Solis and uh, that Aurelio was there with his camera to fulfill his role as a photo journalist in, the, in an arch architectural and social environment far from the usual one in his work, a performance in the, temple, in the opera temple. Like any photo, the one selected for analysis is a, re a record and a trace. It gives visibility here and now to the past and works as an instrument of memory. Aurelio Gonzalez took photos, took photos so that the next day El Popular will reflect what happened before his camera. He recorded what happened so that readers could contrast it, could contrast it with what their authorities declare. Aurelio used to say, if it's there, it happened. In the context of the, his series of, photo, of photographs of the general strike, was that of the Teatro Solis destined to be published? Even guided by the image text interaction provided by the uh, anchoring function, function of the caption, how do we connect it with the rest of the set? The collection of photos uh, where, where the case uh, the case study of this investigation is inserted, both a photographic archive of approximately 50,000 negatives in 35 millimeters, uh, millimeters format that after, after being buried in 1973 was considered lost. But in 2006, it was located, recovered, and taken into custody 
in the Montevideo Photography Center where the negatives were preserved, documented, and digitized. Aurelio had been in, char in charge of hiding those negatives. He was the one who carried out the, the search and finally recovered them. I have found no evidence that the photo selected for the study ended up published in, at the time. According to Aurelio, many times due to space or time, I had taken 40 shots and just one was published. Hence, the reception of the photo was deferred at the time of the exhibition and the publications when the political and cultural effects of its circulation had changed. At the time, after the, the definite, definitive end of the strike and with the exile of thousands of opponents scattered around the world, the pictures taken by Aurelio Gonzalez acquired new meaning. They became symbols of identity for the group of exiles. In Gonzalez's own book of, of stories and in the exhibition, this photo continues to stand out as an strange element in the whole of the pro protagonist throwing paper from a desk to the, to the air and the purpose of putting uh, the aesthetic of performativity before the rep representation. We realized that the proposal needed an anchor in the memory of the place or of the collective memory in the place. Thus, we concentrated on the reconstruction of the photo case study with no other data than that correspondence with the year in which the dictatorship began in Uruguay. In a tangle scene with the hall fully lit, flyers were thrown from the top floor. Each one had a name taken from the list of Uruguayan detainees, detainees who were disappeared by the di dictatorship. The date of their disappearance and their age, their, excuse me, their, their age at uh, the time they disappeared. After the music ended, there was a long silence left, which immediately transformed into applause. As an image, the flyers are the consummation of a ritualized form that, by way of its poetic function, specifies the aesthetic function. They incite reception and provoke a specific sensation in the audience, which charge the action with a particular weight of value. When our stage proposal was presented to the orchestra by the musical director, the story of the uh, scene of the flyers falling on the audience caused an interruption. One of the cellists revealed himself as part of the group that had thrown the flyers in the photo. A year later, I was able to interview Fernando Rodriguez and thus get closer to the memory of that rehearsal in which he, in turn, recalled Silveira. She had been a co-worker and friend of hers. During the interview I conducted with her, Mrs. Silveira's account of the scene made her, made her access to the memory of the years lived in dictatorship. She told me how the, that experience in the theater became something indescribable, in, incredible, but registered in sensations which developed later on. In our various communications, she repeatedly expressed the impact experienced during the performance produced by emotion. She reflected, I was mobilized by many things that had happened to me during the 70s. She added, the 70s were hard years, really hard, and she accessed very sharp details of that time in a story sometimes interrupted by an emotional tone. Coincidentally, her husband appears in another of Aurelio, Aurelio Gonzalez's classic photos, one of the mobilizations of July 9, 1973, a las cinco de la tarde, a las cinco en punto de la tarde. The dramaturgical proposal took an image as an, a source of knowledge and its contemplation as an act of investigation. It articulated the concept of memory and montage, the detail, the quotation, and the fragment, in order to generate an anachronistic space of silence that contained them. Given the close relationship that can be established between aesthetic proposal and social life, 
it, wa it was possible that remains of personal history associated with collective history came to light ready to be elaborated. This occurs because of the lack of logic, the nonsense opens in the, light, in the timelines of historical fact, the gap of their survival. The power of a manifestation of the past emerged through an, ima through an image that intercepts the time of now. There is an aff affectation of temporality, an interruption that stops the meaning, a pulse charged with tension, an instant of suspension, the detention becomes a space of reflection. The work with the selected photo and its use in a research on creation reception processes in the field of the scenic and musical art evidences the character of resonance box purported by images. Their way of tensioning and articulating diverse knowledge shows themselves as a fold in relation to history. In addition to the circumstances that surround the case of, of this photo in the mishap of its author, it is understood that this record of what could be a tr trivial detail shows that the present is woven of multiple paths. From a work perspective on collective memory and emotional experience, the researched material, the selected photo and the men mentioned scene as a starting point of, for evocation can be taken as exteriorization, as condenser of sensitive mechanism. The flyer's image should be re read in terms of the survival of forms. In this case, an action is signified in terms of an impression of the time or times on the very forms of our current life. The, recep the reception becomes a space of thought or uh, for contemplation at the core of the culture and allows us to explain the break in history as return. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a really mm, very, very interesting this the way to, 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 mm. to inter the double interpretation of the picture of the photo as a source for uh, history and uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a uh, drama theatrical perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know if there are, there are any questions. Uh, Christine, maybe Christine Fischer. And I think um, it proved Abi Warburg to be true again because it triggered my cultural memory in several ways, the picture you showed, and also the um, methodology of taking a picture that was taken from a performative moment and putting it back to performativity was very convincing. And my cultural memory was triggered in two ways, actually, as an opera scholar. I remembered an article, I don't know if you know that, by Bruno Forman in early music. He published an article about a painting of Venetian opera, beginning of the 18th century, that exactly captures the moment of falling leaflets in a theater, which totally triggered what I saw <laughs> there. And uh, taking the fact that actually theater was um, a kind of display of the Venetian Republic, there's also a political component to it. And the other thing that was triggered, and it may be even closer to what you're doing, is I studied in Munich, and the main building of the university in Munich is actually built like a theater. And there is an iconic moment um, of falling leaflets having taken place there. The resistance movement of the um, Scholl syllables um, um, they were throwing leaflets from the upper empire of the building down as an act of resistance against the Nazi regime. And afterwards they were arrested and executed. Um, so there are different um, pictures actually you could relate that to in, in different cultures. And I just want to encourage you to, to really take this iconic moment of falling leaflets and do more investigation into the cultural history of that. It's really most convincing. Uh, th th this, this, um, this helps me. Yeah. No fue la primera vez que, que, que 
cayeron. Neither in Teatro Feliz uh, nor in, 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 in Uruguayan uh, uh, theater, theater history. But uh, that was uh, not a um, no fue impedimento para que lo, lo usaran. Oh, dear. Ah, <laughs> we decided to use uh, this, this picture. See, no, the the the, 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 the polyp uh, mixed with the, with the the um, relatives of the, the disappeared. Ah, the, the pictures, the yeah. photos. Uh. Uh, the relatives was in the stage with with the, this. This, uh, this banner, this banner uh, this is the same used uh, in May. We, we, we opening the, the opera in September. And this banner was used with, yes, yes, in a manifestation in silence uh, mm -hmm. in, in the main uh, avenue of the city. Um, so we, we mixed these two, the two <laughs> elements of political elements, because, because uh, um, it, it's, it's something uh, in, in Uruguay uh, that have no uh, resolution. <laughs> there is also this, uh, this uh, topic a moment in this film, uh, Senso by Visconti. At the beginning, they, they are starting the, the resurgimental uh, action, throwing out this, this, all this paper, this uh, uh, flyer. And uh, no, it is a, a, ver a very strong yes. And moment. Yes, uh, Marita. The scene of the consul was especially uh, adequate for this, but the moment when the flyers in the consul uh, lie well down done. with the name of the dis disappeared, disappeared was really a strong moment. Where each of one received a name of a, a real person that was more that we know we didn't know we don't know where are. Hmm? This is important. The, the, I think the, 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 the technical, the, the, the theatrical research and the emotive uh, element. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. And now is uh, the, the, um, the turn of our last uh, uh, last uh, speaker, uh, the last speaker of this session, uh, and also the last speaker of this uh, conference. Uh, now we, we, we invite uh, Jose Raimundo Noros. Uh, the mask? Uh, yes. Uh, our speaker is an art historian, uh, and uh, his paper, the title of his paper mm. is uh, The Artistic World of José Relvas in his article for Art Musical and the uh, Voyage of a Violin. Thank you. Please. Good afternoon. First of all, let me thank to the organization, particularly to Professor Luzia and my friend Nuno Prates, whom I've worked closely during my research for the PhD. This is part uh, of what uh, I found during the period I was here, about six months in the archives of the Casa dos Patudos. My PhD is a political biography of José Relvas, but I, I found some documents and I also try to do an inventory of all his writings including the artistic ones. So this presentation is a work in progress really because my main focus was his political ideas and not his artistic ones. But I think there's uh, room to develop this subject as you may see. Uh, as a short introduction, I presented by um, 
what my thesis is in 10 chronologic chapters. I analyzed the political um, portrait of José Arraldos from his early youth to the end of his life. He, I defined three periods of his political engagement. One as a low, a discreet uh, landowner and musician and art collector and a dandy, uh, but with sympathies with the prog uh, progressist, uh, progressist party during the monarchy, but we also uh, assumed Republican sympathies. Then a uh, third period, the most famous one, where he um, assumed his uh, militants in the Republican Party and after the revolution took several offices. Then after 1919, he abandoned, abandoned political life as the failure for the reform of the party system uh, was not implemented. He became the recluse of the Potudos, as they used to say in the political uh, mediums of, the, of that period, and yet he enjoyed his art collection. He was also personally very depressed due to the death of his older son. Regarding his, um, his early life, he studied law in Coimbra, as you may know, but he finished an art, uh, uh, an art degree uh, in, uh, in the, the, not the faculty that didn't exist, but the superior course of, of liberal arts in Lisbon. He was one of the first to obtain that degree. It was a, a course that was made by first by King Peter V. During that period, he engaged with his father in musical education. His teacher was the famous uh, violin player and composer, Nicola Ribas. This is a uh, music composed by his teacher for the students, dedicated to King Louis I, but also to the students. I believe this document that it's in the National Library, it's the final degree in violin uh, classes to several students of this year. The document, the book, it's a book, it's a, a print, it's not dated, but uh, other sources, I believe it's 1883. And this is a, compo a composition dedicated from the teacher to Dr. José Relvis, which allows us to date after his, um, his graduation. From the beginning of his youth, he showed various interest in art, art collecting, and particularly in music. He was the proud owner of a Stradivarius. And that brings us to the voices of our violin, because here in Petudos, it doesn't, it's not here anymore, but it was the only Stradivarius known to be appraised in Portugal. This violin was, um, this is a photo of Jerusalem Alves of the violin that we dated in 1893, and it was an original uh, violin made by Antonio Stradivarius in, C in 1725, and it was bought by Carlos Relvas. This was um, um, studied in an article uh, by Miguel Angelo Lambertini in the magazine Da Arte Musical, which makes the whole history of the violin. This violin was uh, first appraised by its first owner in Portugal, Carlos Relvas, which was also a landowner and uh, um, farmer and a dandy with a very eclectic lifestyle. And, uh, Due to doubts about the authenticity, he had it appraised by Portuguese musicians and also France, French experts. Uh, after, uh, after the violin passed on to his son, his son tried to trade it because he didn't like how it sounded. It wasn't very interesting in being the proud owner of the Stradivarius. He tried to trade it. Eventually, he had it restored in uh, 1885. Then he had it appraised in the beginning of the century by the house he eventually sold it to. The house still works nowadays. It's a very famous house in London, William Hill and Sons. They approved an authenticity diploma, which is kept in the archives of Casa dos Petudos, and um, guaranteed the violin in this period, 1903, was worth 30,000 francs. 
which would amount to this historical statistic site what makes a formula with the gold standard to about two, 300,000 years, around 300,000 years. Um, then uh, politics was kind of harsh for Jose Reyes. He didn't make money out of politics. He went bankrupt, basically because of his diplomatic lifestyle in Madrid. He spent a lot of money trying to maintain a composure that allowed him to represent po Portugal uh, as a diplomat with dignity, what he believed was dignity, and he endured a lot of debt. Also, he made a lot of art investments that you uh, already saw in Casa dos Portugueses, a lot of purchases. So when he came back before World War I, his business was uh, somehow uh, managed to stay afloat. So one of the things he sold, not just, was his Stradivarius violin. He sold his Stradivarius violin in May 1914 in two installments of 500 pounds, and the Stradivarius went to London. Then we don't know what happened. I have contact William E. and Sons, but I'm still waiting to res for a response to try to see if they have the records of this particular violin. This amount would be less than it was worth in 1903, around uh, with the same type of formula. This amount he sold the violin was 240 euros with the same formula. Why did he sold it? Basically because he needed the money to pay for constructions in his house and to prepare for what we knew would be an economic crisis. In this period, there was not war yet, but he as a, a keen businessman was trying to see that the panorama wouldn't be good for his uh, agricultural business. Another side of my research um, regarding uh, politics of José Ralvas was to see how his political and social ideas are presented in his critical art essays. So the example I bring to you are the essays and the short texts he published in the, in the musical uh, magazine, the Arte Musical, Musicianal Art. This is an example of this magazine that he has uh, in a book form, but it was a monthly magazine published by the musician and also an instrument craftsman, and uh, he has a, an instrument store in Lisbon, Miguel Angelo Lambertini, which was a close friend to Jose Alves. Mainly the articles of Jose Alves are not about music, but about fine arts, sculpture and painting. But they also synthesize all the arts. What he wants to tell, it's the social importance of the artist's speech, and they critical appraise some artists and some, um, some artworks. These uh, articles are also the reflection of Jose Alves' voyages throughout Europe. They are part of a bigger picture. They are part of a manuscript we located in the archives of the Casa dos Petudos that Ralvas called Recordações de Arte, Art Memoirs, that is unpublished. He left it partially prepared to be published, even including an, uh, uh, an, an, art, uh, an index with artists' names, an onomastic index, and add a final version. Why he didn't want to publish such a book on his voyages to see art through Europe, we don't know. This is a map I made with Nuno Prates about the Ralva's voyage throughout Europe. You see the colors. We try to identify the reasons he made his voyages. Many of them were to see arts, to see music concerts, to see museums, and to appreciate the cultural centers of Europe. We're not sure if he went to Italy and Greece in different periods of his life, but all those other voyages to Central Europe are documented. During 1902 to 1903, his son, Carlos Loredo Ralvas, lived and studied music and both music and business managed in Leipzig. Eventually, due to a bohemian lifestyle, he came to a clash with his father and abandoned uh, his, uh, his, he, he concluded his musical formation, but abandoned the, the business management and returned to uh, Portugal. Some of these voyages, as you may see in Port 
purple were also related to his political entanglement and tried to co-conspirate uh, international support for the Republican movement before and after the revolution. Others were related to business. Uh, the presence, for instance, in Dutrecht was uh, really uh, important wine and uh, uh, a wine market to export his wines to north, uh, northern and central Europe. Other places like Bordeaux or, uh, or even Madrid or also places he did business both in wine or in artworks. He did also that. He's, he traded artworks and sold them too. Um, regarding his articles in Arte Musical, we made a systematization. Some of them were not signed, and to the manuscripts we found in the archive, we, we were able to identify them. Some, we attribute them based on the initials, as you may see here, and on the style of the article. So, as you see in Portugal, most of the articles are about uh, painter and sculptor fine arts. Only uh, the three, three articles about the festival Pugno e Isaí, I'll talk about that in a short time, and one about the concerts he attended in Austria and Germany while he was there and several uh, times. This is a graphic on the subjects. You see painter critiques are the most uh, of the articles and then music critiques, news uh, we we make a, a subject that uh, new music news because they are not uh, critique articles. They are articles making news of the festival he organized with his friends, and also a sculpture critique that we are going to show you. His um, artistic world is a very vast subject, as you may know from the collections. But from these articles, they approached several artists of his time. First. One, and perhaps the most surprising one, is a romantic appraisal of Puvit Chavan, which he, he portrays as a person more close to the primitive medievalist painters before the Renaissance, and also, as you may see by the quote I chose, um, makes a sense of his feeling of a religion without particularism. This appraisal of the religious ideal, uh, but not clericalism, in a person that is Republican and very close to agnostic and atheistic movements in politics, it's very interesting in Joe Zarelvis because he and his first, for instance, his graduation thesis has an idea that we cannot criticize religion for the wrongdoing based on a religious idea. So this ideal of uh, um, a social conception of Christianity without clericalism and without organized religion is common in his political and artistic thought. Uh, uh, he has works on that too in another magazine on Rafael Santi. Here, an appraisal of Malloa, his close friend and favorite painter, uh, based on, as he says, the interpretation of Malhoa of the Portuguese lifestyle, the Portuguese uh, impressions of life in the rural countryside and his uh, um, interpretation of that with a naturalistic point of view with the school of Silva Porto and also a French naturalistic influence. Is a mo more um, strong critique was um, is dislike of the Max Klinger monument or Max Klinger sculpture on Beethoven in Leipzig. He really didn't like that sculpture and made a strong critique in the magazine that the, the artist didn't understand what Beethoven was all about in the Rosa, Jose Rovas point of view. He said that sculpture imprisoned Beethoven's style in a, um, a contemplative man that was and the musician and uh, artist was for Ralvis anything but, as you may see here, the, the, the sculpture we were talking about. And um, one aspect important in his, in his life and in the magazine was the festival Pugno Azai. 
Ralvis and some close friends managed to finance and bring to Lisbon to three concerts these artists that they adored. And this was a project that didn't have contingency to bring famous European artists to Lisbon for seasons like they were in Madrid and other uh, European capitals. The festival was a success, both uh, with critiques regarding the public and they, they, didn't, they didn't lose money. So the, the festival was a success both uh, artistically and even economic. The, the revenue was given to a, an artistic school of young musicians. And this uh, conclusions I have here are more lines for research. As I said, this is a work in progress. I believe as Umberto Davila, which was um, one of the few persons that I studied, Jose Ralvis from a musician point of view, he stated in his essay of 1984 that Ralvis could have been a professional violin player if he wanted. Uh, Joseph Ralph's regarding the voyage of a violin didn't seem to have particular affection for his lifestyle, even though it was an inheritance and a gift from his father, he sold it when he had a difficult period in his estate. In his magazine, he, in the magazine he collaborated, his uh, articles and critiques are appraisals of the artists and the art experiences he's like, in a very introspective style, but also bearing in mind the social aspect of art and the social transformation art can have. Uh, we identified also several texts in other magazines, such Art, directed by Martis Geddes, and even a French magazine, Comédia, uh, which was in a later period of his life. So we believe that, is, is it possible to have a research with would take some time and perhaps a research project that through his lifespan, uh, we should uh, systematize research in several uh, art uh, magazines, both in Portugal and abroad, where we can find more production of José Alves in this matter. Another objective in the, in the long term, perhaps, was to fixate the text of the manuscript I told you about, Notas de Viagem e Recordações de Arte, with the, the purpose of having a critical um, edition of such unpublished texts, which is very rich, as you may um, suppose. Here, to finish my presentation, a famous portrait of Malhoa of Jose Ralvas playing the violin. And here are some notes that, and some references of what I have presented. Thank you very much. This presentation, this uh, uh, representation of uh, this, uh, music, the, 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 the musical life uh, in this uh, um, around the, the the beginning of the century, and uh, maybe there are any questions about uh, this work in progress, uh, this research uh, still in progress. Uh, Marita, no, no, no. Yeah. Yes. No, it seems that uh, everything is off. Like, okay, is yeah. fine, and uh, so I think that we can uh, close this session, and maybe uh, we close this session, and maybe Lucia uh, is. Uh, we can. Yes.